God's Word. It's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord yes. and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. To show forth thy living kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Amen. Upon the instruments of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with the solemn sound. For thy Lord has made me glad yes. in thy work. I will triumph in the work of thy hand. I read to you Psalms 92, verses 1 through 4. And may the Lord bless the hearers and doers of his holy word. Amen. 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 Lord, we are here today with you. We come to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for another day. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for the food that was on my table this morning. That you fed us this morning, Lord. Lord, we know and we realize now thank you, thank how good you really have been to us. Because somebody didn't have breakfast this morning. Somebody didn't wake up this morning. Yes, yes. God, we let you know. We know we blessed this morning. You've been a good God. Thank you, Jesus. You're watching over us, Lord. You've been watching over us. Yes, yes. Lord, sometimes I just feel so bad when I just know I should give you more glory. I should give you more honor. I should worship you even more heartily, Lord. Because your son Jesus said for us to love you first, to love you above all things. God, we love you. And we thank you for all that you do in our life. You watched over our children last night. You watched over our grandchildren last night. You kept us all, Lord. We have so much to be thankful for. So much to thank you for, Lord. You've been a good God to all of us. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you've been watching over our seniors, Lord. Thank you for keeping them safe and protected, Lord. Thank you, Lord. A lot of might not feel good right now, and I have aches and pains, but through it all, God, you still gave them the strength to be able to make it out to your house to worship your name. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for all of us, Lord. We love you. We love you. We adore you. And we're here today to praise you, to glorify you. Because that's why we're here. You've been a good God to all of us. You've been a good, good God to all of us. Yes, Lord. Because, Lord, when we look around at the rest of the world, Lord, the world is in uproar. It's a lot of suffering. There are people who don't even have homes to go to. They don't even have a place of safety. God, I mean, you've been good to us. But, God, we do recognize and we do see that there are some people that's less fortunate than what you have been doing for us. And we ask, Lord, that you look in at them as well. Keep them safe too, Lord. Give them food on their table, Lord. Yeah. Even though, Lord, they might not even know you, Lord. Yeah. But we know you, Lord. And, Lord, I pray that we share you with others. We talk about you with others. Yeah. Because our young people need to hear yeah. and know and understand who you are and how much they need you in their lives. Because we know we need you. But there are so many others that need to know that you are there for them too. And you love them just like you love us. And we thank you, Lord, for this day. Pray in the name of Jesus.
where my Savior died. Down where I'm cleansed. Yeah. I'm seeing our God. There tomorrow was love.
examine what the Lord had to say to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Smyrna, to the church at Pergamon. And on last week, if you were here, we heard what the Lord had to say to the church at Thyatira. Today, we want to hear what the Lord has to say to church number five, if I can say it that way. The church at Sardis. Turn with me if you have your Bible. Let us look, if you will, at chapter three, yeah. verse six. And when you find it, would you say amen? amen? To the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, say this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their garments. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will erase his name from, I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And then verse 6, as we have heard four times before, now it becomes the same statement for the fifth time. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. You may be seated. I, there is a text that I do want you to turn and just put your bullet in the end. For I want you to see the word of the Lord even later. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And again today, we want to look at, examine, Listen very carefully to the Lord's message to the church at Sardis. The Lord's message to the church at Sardis. Mm -hmm. In November the year 2009, news outlets reported on a story out of Brussels, Belgium, concerning a man who had been in a vegetative state for 23 years after a horrible automobile accident. On the outset, he had all the signs of unconsciousness, paralysis, unresponsiveness to stimuli, and brain scans that suggested a lack of awareness, nothing short of being dead. Yeah. However, upon closer examination, that man had remained conscious for 23 years. Outwardly, he had the appearance of being dead. Yeah. But the test results suggested otherwise that he was quite alive. Mm -hmm. Whether or not the conclusions of the physicians and the scientists are to be believed, the story does bring up a very important point. In the same way, here is the question. Is it possible to misdiagnose a church? Is it possible that a church on the outside can appear to be alive while it's really dead. Yeah. And while that may seem strange or unusual question to many of us here, let me say to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not just a possibility, it is a reality. When it comes to the church, there is an easily forgotten truth that we need to remember that's recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. And when I, re when I repeat it, you will catch on. You will remember it for it says, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Yeah. And so today, beloved, we're going to read what many scholars call a church's obituary. Yeah. 
outwardly, they thought that they were alive. They, they even gave all of the signs of being alive, but according to Jesus' diagnosis, that's where it matters the most. In the eyes of the Lord, they were dead. And so as we lean into the text, I believe that there are at least four important details contained in this letter to the church at Sardis that are for us to consider today. Very first point, I believe that rings loud from this text is a settled desert destination of the correspondence. A settled destination of the correspondence. You will see that this letter has been written to the church at Sardis. And the name Sardis literally means escaping ones. Sardis was a city that bragged and boasted that celebrated its past being wealthy and splendid. It, it was known for its wool, its textile, and even its jewelry industry. Yeah. But it had a deteriorated greatly. Its greatness really lay in the yesterday of it. It lay in the past. Sardis at one time had been considered to be, yes, indestructible because of its ideal physical arrangement and topography for its defense. In other words, it sat on a hill or a mountain surrounded by steep cliffs, almost impossible to scale with only one narrow way of approach. However, Story is told that one night someone who was on guard was who was working and happened to have lost an article and they found a way how to get through one of the crevices and their enemies were watching and their enemies who wanted to try to decimate, destroy, level the city wasn't able to do it until they found a way how to get in. Yeah. And when they got in, they left nothing of the city. Sardis had been attacked and conquered twice because of its arrogance manifested in its lack of watchfulness. It was also widely known to be a place of idol worship. Yes, beloved, Sardis had it, had it going on in the eyes of some, but in the eyes, brother, where of the Savior, there was a death sentence written all over it. Well, secondly, it was, in this text, a sacred description of the Christ. You can't read these verses without Jesus saying something about himself. And in the introduction of each of the letters sent to the churches, Jesus is spoken in a very different way, and he has spoken or describes himself in a very different way in order that it is significant in order to address the churches that are being written to. Yeah. Here it is in case you missed it. In other words, in each of the introductions of these seven letters, there is a description concerning Jesus that is unique to each church. This introductory statement exalts both the person of Christ, but it also exalts the possession of Christ. Yeah. And as we have seen in the last four letters, Jesus gives an answer to the problem or the problems that are found in each church. And that is what we see in the very first verse. Look at it if you got it, if you will. Open. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Yeah. Jesus declares two important facts concerning himself. Do you see it? First, Jesus says that he is the one who has the seven spirits of God. This is really nothing more than a statement of affirmation of the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who makes the church what it is. Yeah. The Word of God is confirmed by the Spirit of God. Jesus is telling the church that the Holy Spirit is the one who is both present, but he is also the one who empowers the church. Yeah. But there is, there's something else. Mother Williams, that Jesus says about himself, where he says, and the seven stars. Yeah. And the seven stars is a designation of the seven messengers or the seven pastors of the church. Yes. Well, 
Not only do we see a subtle designation of the correspondence, not only do we see a sacred description of Christ, but then here's where we walk into the meat of the text. There is a sad diagnosis of the church. A sad diagnosis of the church. You don't mind if I take my time and work my way through this, do you? While everyone thought the church in Sardis had it going on, while everybody in the city of Sardis thought the church was so full of spiritual life, not so said the same. He wasn't getting his cues from the folk in the house. He got his cues because he was a presence in it. Jesus was saying with strong, with strong disagreement that in light of what everybody else was bragging about the church of Sardis and how everybody thought it was going on, Jesus says, based on my estimation, are y'all listening? Because you see, here's where we get it all wrong. We make estimations about the greatness of churches by a whole lot of stuff that doesn't even factor in when it comes to the Lord. Yeah. Oh yeah, we we will we we will judge a church based on how good the choir can sing. Okay, yeah. we will make that, we will make decisions about how many programs they got and all that other stuff. And Jesus says you can be busy and be busy for everything other than me. You can be loud for everybody who show up in the pew, who clap and holler and scream, but it becomes nothing but noise to me. Y'all ought to read the Bible. Isn't that what he said to the church of Corinth? Uh, that you're nothing more than just a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. In case you have lost lost some track of yesteryear when your baby or your niece, nephew, or grandchild came over, had a spoon in the pot, and they were just having a good time, just having fun, just hitting it. Y'all remember that, don't you? And at first he thought it was cute. Oh, but put a little time on it. After a while, what sounded cute ended up becoming something that was annoying. The death sentence was pronounced upon the church at Sardis because, listen to this, the Holy Spirit is no longer in the church. Now that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's presence isn't in the building. What's worse is Jesus is telling the church that the Holy Spirit Oh, I hate to tell you this. Jesus says the Holy Spirit is no longer in the congregation. Wow. Can I just take my time and preach this today? Talk about an announcement that should make us sit up and take notice. Talk about an announcement that would get our attention. Jesus tells this church that the death sentence has been leveled against you because the spirit of life does not dwell in or among you. Yeah. Now, try and process that for a minute and see if it doesn't make you uneasy. For Jesus, not, 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 not the visitors. Jesus, who is the head of the church, who says to the church, Based on my estimation, based on my assessment of you, Jesus makes this claim is to also say that he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. The Lord doesn't have to listen to any reports from anybody else. He's in the midst of them. Okay, let me say this to you. So some of y'all looking like you're bored. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, don't you know he knows how you live? Yeah. Don't you know he knows what you think? Don't yeah. you know he knows yeah. how you talk? Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is not somebody when you walk into a building looking like a church that you ain't known the Holy Spirit to drop down. Ain't about no Holy Spirit dropping down. Yeah. No, uh, the Holy Spirit is in you and I who are shown up born again believers. Jesus says his mission and mandate is to lead
turn around and preach, so I'm going to go ahead and just what you ask me to. For Jesus to make this claim is to also know if anybody knows what's up in the church, yeah. it's he who died for it, rose for it, coming back for it, and lives in the midst of it. And so God, the church is starting, they may have a building to worship in, we don't know how big or how luxurious it is. Unfortunately for them, the Holy Spirit left and didn't even leave before when he had dressed. My God, what do you do when the Lord says to Satan, here is a Christmas gift, Merry Christmas, and he gives the devil the church. Not the building he left. Not, not, not just the head. No. He left the folk who show up to have a good time on Sunday. He hears a strong and clear message to the church today, the love that comes with this morning. Listen, church. Being a church is more than what you sit on and what you worship in. Amen. Church is a Greek word in the New Testament, ecclesia, which literally means transliterated to go from the original language to a language we can identify and understand it. It means the called out ones. Not the ones that get called out and go back in and stay in. Called out to stay out. It's about the people of Jesus Christ. And beloved, if the church is indeed the church of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit must be present in the people and he must have the right and the room to guide and to direct the church as he is his. He has every right to say no or yes. And yet up to this point, Jesus hasn't spoken severe words to the church until now. And the message that he gives to this church is one that they cannot afford to ignore, turn their head and look in another direction or to take a lightly. I did my homework, so I'd just like to share with you the fact that I ain't talking off the cuff. Of uh, the seven churches, the church in Sardis is the only one that the Lord leveled a death sentence on. For the church in Smyrna, Jesus gave them words of praise. For the churches at Ephesus, Pergamos, and Thyatira, Jesus had both words of praise and condemnation. Their letters were a mixture of praise and criticism. Oh, but the church at Sardis, the church at Sardis, Jesus had nothing good to say about it. And think about this. For a church to fall into a state or condition of no praise from the Lord is frightening. And here's the irony or the strange thing about all of this. Although the Lord didn't have any good thing to say about it, in the eyes of the people, now, now we're talking about different groups, it was looked upon as being the church of what's going on. It was looked upon as being a productive and progressive church in the community. Can I tell you, beloved, that it doesn't matter how well the church looks in the eyes of the folk that come in the building. Or what the church is doing and accomplishing while receiving the applause and the approval of people. Where it all boils down and where it matters most is with the Lord. I believe there's a TV program, Dance with the Stars. And they have, how many of those panelists? I knew somebody was going to watch them. Thank you for helping They got four people. And you know, after certain performances, four, six, ten. And then they add up all of the scores. Because you got another set that's coming on the set in order to compete against the set that just made an exit. Yeah. And whoever has the most points are going to win. Mm -hmm. But let's remove those four folk and let's take it off dancing with the stars and let's just say evaluation by the Savior. Yeah. And so when the church of Sardis shows up and does his thing, the Lord says, Zero. Mm. 
The church of Sardis had a reputation that they were exciting, that that was a church to go to. They, they, they are alive over there. But underneath the surface, the Lord not only saw differently, the Lord said something, and it wasn't complimentary. Hear it again. He says, you're not alive, you're dead. Yeah. It was a church that was Christian in name only because that's what the people in the church called themselves. But that's not how the Lord saw them. He said they were dead. Jesus never makes a false diagnosis, everybody. And so when it came to this church, Jesus read this church, the last rites, just like he did when he read them to the religious Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27 and 28. I'll read the to you, glad that you wrote it down. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombstones, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside they are full of dead men's bones and uncleanliness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to people, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Great. How do you how do you recover from such a diagnosis? Yeah. Well, the next point in the passages show us a set of directives for the church. Because in verses 2, 3, and 4, Jesus gives the direction the church needs to go in. I make none of this up. I want to make sure I can see it so I read it right. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come. But you have a few folk in Sardis who have not sold their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Yeah. Jesus gives four encouraging remarks that I believe will help them to move from being a dead church to being an alive church. If it'll work in Sardis, it'll work in Warren. Yeah. First, Jesus tells them, wake up. Now, you got to understand, sometimes when I say wake up, in the sanctuary, I, 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 I see folk, they, they physically sleep. I don't know if they listen. You know, maybe some people can listen as well, sleep as they can while they are awake. But let me say this, that it's impossible to listen to the Lord while you are spiritually asleep. Yeah. Jesus says, y'all need to wake up. In other words, things are serious with you and you can't continue to keep going on as business as usual. You, you don't have time to stay spiritually asleep. And what is an important truth that needs to be, brothers and sisters, obeyed and followed through and by every church of the Lord Jesus Christ today, is that not a need? The church of Jesus Christ is seemingly falling asleep today on matters of morality. The church of Jesus Christ today has seemingly fallen asleep on sin. We live in a culture, preach past, I'm doing the best I can. We live in a culture where anything goes and that mindset has found its way in the church today. There was a day when the church stood up and walked the street against sin, but no. The church today has allowed the world to settle in, and we are in a bad place. Yeah. Jesus is calling the church to not only wake up, but he's also telling the church to stay awake. Yeah. It's late, and as grandmama they were saying, the sun is going down, and Jesus is on his way back. You don't have to believe me, you ought to read the Bible. In Acts chapter 1, while those star-gazing disciples were looking up into the heavens, watching Jesus ride that cloud like folk arriving in the escalator. And they came, one of them came back and said, Oh, you men of Galilee, while you stand there looking up into the sky, the same way he left, he's coming back. And if the church knows Jesus is coming back, we ought to be like that one song they used to sing. Get right with God. I got a lot 
I'm going to preach and they're doing that one. Thank y'all for giving me a chance to preach. This is a call to alertness. Not just to them, but to us. And the first call to a dead church by the Lord is a call to awareness. Can I tell you that churches die because they allow doctrinal error to slip into the membership? Beloved, we have got to hold fast the biblical truth and let the words of Jude chapter 1, because they but one, and verse 3 be our standard, where it says, Contend for the faith that was once given to the saints. And that contend means you dig your heels in and hold on for dear life for the word of God that was delivered to the saints. We're living in a day where in a whole lot of churches, opinions are preached, magazine articles are preached, but not the word of God. Folk are not saved by what's in the inquiry. Folk are saved by what's in the book. A lot of preachers are too scared to talk about sin because they're worried about you saying too many times and folk are going to leave the church. It could be that they were never in it in the first place. Just tears that are just looking like we. Lord, have me preach your word today. The importance of waking up and staying alert is not an option. Jesus is not saying if you feel like it. No, Jesus is saying you don't have any option. This is a requirement. Yes, sir. The problem with the chart, the church of Silas, can be seen in many of our churches today that want the approval and the acceptance of people why it suffers the rejection of the Lord. Yeah. And at some point, the church has got to answer the question which one is more important. Is it more important to please the world and have the world's approval? Or is it more important to please the Lord? The Lord is telling the church of Sardis, and I believe they're also talking to the church today, that we need to be sensitive to the inroads of the invasions of sin in the church. Be awake, be alert, be attentive to cultural trends that seek to get the church to not just join in with them, but more importantly, to adopt practices that were never meant for the church to participate in. Yeah. Church was never meant to participate in trunk and treat. Yeah. I knew it was going to get quiet. Yeah. So let me give you a heads up. You need to understand that Halloween is a celebration of the dead. Yeah. It is a satanic holiday. And I've said it before, if your children, whoever it is, need that much candy, why don't you go buy for them as opposed to getting them dressed up yeah. in satanic costumes? Yeah. 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 Inroads into the church. Well, we are naming something else. You can name it all you want. You can put a Volkswagen, you can put a Rolls Royce tie tag on the hood of a Volkswagen, but it'll always be a Volkswagen. See, I done made some of y'all mad. I can need at least five folks that'll help me to keep on preaching. Because too many of our churches want to worry about pleasing the world and use tags about getting young folk in the, get young folk and their folks into Christ, and you ain't got to worry about using trunk or treats in order to get them to He said, strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. Here we see the way of the few and the way of the many. Here's a word of caution and a word of compliment. Mm -hmm. The word of caution, here it is. Jesus says, be careful. Stay alert. And do not fall prey to false teachings and ungodly world practices that seek to get in and stay in the church. Then there's a word of compliment. Jesus is congratulating some in this church that are strong in their convictions of righteousness and rooted in the word of the Lord. Thank God for the saints that won't compromise. Oh, y'all, 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 y'all. If you want to live, you should have hollered loud. 
They thank God for, for, for saints that will not give way to cultural truth. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and he's going to be the same tomorrow. And though our, our, our message may change, our message should never change. You get Jesus out of the church, you ain't got a church. I don't know what you got. But it ain't a church. If Jesus ain't running the church, I don't know what you got. And if Jesus is running the church, there are some things he will not permit or stand for. Here it is, in case you miss it, maybe I'll bring it home to you. For many of us in this room that have principles about what happens in and out of our house. Yeah. I remember my, my brother who was a cigarette smoker. My father made it very clear to him. Don't bring that in here. Yeah. Too much nowadays, too much has been brought in the church. Yeah. We don't know where to start getting rid of some stuff. Yeah. We're in compliment. Jesus is congratulating you. This ain't easy. This ain't easy sermon today, y'all. Jesus is congratulating some of the church that are strong in their convictions of righteousness and rooted in the word of God. You can call me all out of mind. You can call me so Bible-centered, I don't mind. But I want to tell you, when it comes to sin, I'm going to start, I'm going to side with the Savior as opposed to siding against the Savior. I'd rather side with Jesus where there's wrong in the church than siding with the church against its Savior on sin. <laughs> Jesus is telling this church that those who have not polluted themselves with the paganism of the culture, why this? He said, they are the ones who are going to walk with me. How important it is for our Christian witness, beloved, that we protect it at all costs, even when there are churches that are willing to cast caution to the wind by engaging in practices that weaken the church's mission and message, especially when it comes to holy living and sin. Yeah. Well, third, in verse 3, Jesus gives a combination of encouragements. Look at them with me. He says, remember what you have received and heard. In other words, take serious the sermons in the Bible studies that you were taught. Hold the word of God close. And then he says, keep it. He says, keep it. If you keep it, it'll keep you. Whatever you do, don't let it go. Whatever you do, don't abandon it. Whatever you do, hold on to it for dear life, for kindness, and for protection. And, and it doesn't lace the instructions I need to Paul gave to Pastor Timothy of Ephesus in his last letter in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I ask you to turn to it. I need you to hear, hear what the word of God says. And then let me say a thing or two. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead and his appearing and his kingdom preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Prove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come. Yes, sir. And can I stop right there and tell you, it wasn't a matter of waiting for it to show up, it was already there. And if this was hundreds of years ago that it was already there, think of how it is one rampant even right now. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Yeah. But after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned on the fables. We're living in such a day. Some people are wondering, even in a pandemic, why? Why is it that folk ain't coming to church no more? I got I, the Bible has an answer. Because so much do you have. Right. Yeah. And so when you connect with Paul saying to Timothy what Jesus is saying to the church in Sardis, it walks hand in hand. You cannot talk about having a vibrant spiritual life when the Lord says that there's not even a pulse when I put you on the meter. He said, Well, I show up, you can show up and still don't grow up. 
You can show up every Sunday and still go to the Word of God. We're not going to get brownie points because we come to church on Sunday. The question is, what are you doing with the messages? And the message of the church then and now is simply this. A church dies when the Holy Spirit no longer has control of the people in it. Yeah. Please hear these admonitions again. A church dies when the Spirit of God is not an active presence in the lives of the people that come to the building. Listen to some admonitions, and I'm almost done. I thought somebody said, preach some more, Pastor. Preach. Yes, sir. One is to be sensitive to the inroads of sin in the church. Brothers and sisters, don't play with sin because sin won't play with you. That's right. There are some things you can't handle by yourself. Sin is like a set of handcuffs. Once it gets on you and gets its hands on you, it's not going to give you the key and tell you to go ahead and open it. Secondly, be submissive to the Christ of the church. And then thirdly, be submissive to the control of the Spirit of God in the church. And then fourth, be subject to the authority of God's word to the church. Yeah. Look with me again at verse number three. He says, keep it. Yeah. Hold fast. Don't let the word of God go. Follow the word of God. Allow it to govern your life and your conduct, but also let the life of the Spirit of God live in you. Yeah. Let the word of God be the sin of everything that happens in the life of the church as well as in your personal life. Here's the warning again to the church. It's sorry, it's not even it's a warning to the church today. You abandon the word of God, and you will soon be a dead church. Please listen when I tell you, when the word of God comes unimportant in the life of the church, when it becomes unimportant congregationally, when it becomes unimportant to the believer individually, you are on the road to now having a slow death. When Jesus instructs the church to hold fast and repent, he is issuing a plea to return in obedience to the word of God. Beloved, there is no other way to escape death as a church. Jesus tells the church to repent of their sins and return back to God. And this is the same command Jesus gave to the church in Ephesus that it had the process of dying. He offers repentance, which means that you're going to have to turn away from what you are doing and go in another direction. You cannot walk holding the hand of sin in one hand and the hand of the Savior in the other. Yeah. This is not only true for the church, but it's also true for individuals as well. Because the call to action is this. And that is in two words. Be in control of your life. Go back and spend time with the word of the Lord. When's the last time you even read your daily Bible? Your daily word? When's the last time? What does your prayer life look like? Go back and spend time with him. Repent of where you are and where you shouldn't be. And run quickly. To the cross. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, every now and then, well, let me, I was there that night. Here's my last point since y'all are, are walking with me. <laughs> the last and final point is a civil declaration for the church. Yeah. I'm so glad that the Lord could have easily just completely walked away and just say, forgive. He could have done that for every one of us in here. Dr. Charles Stanley, Brother Blue, said it so pointed and poignantly when he says, I'm so glad that the Lord let me live longer, Twilight Miller, to be saved before I die. I'm living in the faces of people in here 
who went to funerals of folk who were running partners, road dogs, homies. Yeah. Your girl, your friends. And you did some of the same stuff they did that put them in a box and you still standing on your feet. Oh, I don't see you act like you ain't done nothing wrong now, homie. It's not all the wrong. Don't see you act like you ain't been wrong and you still might be living wrong. And the Lord says, I'm giving you another day to get straight. I'm giving you another day to get out of that. I'm giving you another day to get out of immorality. I'm giving you another day to quit getting high. I'm giving you another day to quit running the street. I'm giving you an extension. Don't panic me. So see, why are you sitting there angry at me? It ain't about me and you. I don't know what you're doing, but I know somebody who knows what everybody's doing. And the fact that he woke us up this morning, don't take it lightly. Why are you staying on your phone? You need to hear what the word of the Lord said because at the end of every church, he says that him who got ears to hear, let him hear not what the preacher said, not what the deacon said, not what the choir is singing, but what the spirit shot and feel good and cry, but they don't want to live right after all that crying and singing is over. Kind of reminded me of something my dear mother from Havana, Cuba used to say to my brother, are your ears underneath your feet? I was naive, I was one of those smart fellas, and I remember one time I waited until he went to sleep. Because I wanted to make sure that what he had on his head was working. Since my mother asked, are they underneath your feet? Sometimes in preaching, mm. I often wonder, are the ears of the saints underneath their feet? Yeah. I wonder, after some Bible studies, are our ears, where are they? They're more than just apparatuses to receive sound waves and then process it in the processing center of our brain. Yeah. No, no. God's word is alive. It's like a two-edged sword. It's meant to cut and cut out and cut away. Jesus, I'm, 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 done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. You know where about the Browns playing? They'll be playing Pittsburgh next Sunday. In verse number five. Look with me, if you will, at verse number five. He says, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. Yeah. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. What, what an audience, what a moment. Mm -hmm. Jesus, in this verse, makes threefold promises to those that are faithful to him. Can I show them to you? First, Jesus identifies the faithful as overcomers. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they're better than everybody. They're overcomers. It speaks to and about those who have remained faithful and true to the Lord. But then he adds, they shall be clothed in the white garments. Do y'all see that? And the imagery of white robes represents a promise of unblemished eternal righteousness. Ah, uh, those that are in Sardis with one day that are believers in him who are allowing the Holy Spirit to guide and control their lives. Jesus says, I'm making you a promise early that you can believe in and stand on. Yeah. That one day that you will walk in triumph of your Lord. But then Jesus says that I will not block out their names of the book of life. Jesus is promising them that he, listen to this, because this this is serious. He says that he would never erase their names from the book of life. Now the question becomes, who has the pen to write the name in the book? Some time ago, my loving wife and I, we had to go to a calling hour. And you know they have those books. They call them guest books. Something else. Um, and my wife was going over to 
write the names of us and she looked back and she said, you want to? I said, oh, no, don't put my name in that. <laughs> no, I ain't about being superstitious. No, no, uh-uh. I don't want my name in that. Oh, but I can. Uh, yes, I feel just like I want to scream. Mm-hmm. I, I ain't got to guess today. Yeah. yeah. I, I was. I, I, I went to high school and I was. I, I was an honor roll student. I was in the National Honor Society. And 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 they think they sent me a form one time. Uh, saying that because you've been such a studious student that we, we put your name in an honor book, but it's going to cost you X amount of dollars. I, I want to holler, but I can't. Yeah. The day that I gave him my heart, yeah. I trusted him by faith. Yes, yes, yes. And I've been leaning on him for a long time. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I ought to be some folks in the house who know that that's my name in the truth. Yes, sir. Your, your name may not be in the yeah. Oh, but bless the Lamb for evermore. Yeah. My name yeah. is in another book. Yes, sir. Oh, I thought somebody in here would celebrate. Yeah, yeah and, and, and it's written yeah. in a book by He who oversees. Yeah. Because that is.